It seems that at every new vehicle launch or at the auto shows, the message is the same. Auto manufacturers are desperate to attract the next generation of car buyers known as the Y generation. One of those companies is Lexus. In fact, Lexus right now, after some natural disasters and some other challenges, is trying to get back on its feet. In fact, it's in the midst of introducing nine new vehicles. And the latest is actually directed towards the men and women that fathered the Y generation. And this new vehicle is a 2013 Lexus ES. Without being too hard on a Camry and without being too hard on the previous version of this car, it was a little bit of lipstick on a pig. It was basically a Camry that was gussied up a bit and called a Lexus. With this car, it's a little bit more of a bolder departure. It does take a little bit more of its own identity into the reality of it being a Lexus now. I think they know their customer here. It's definitely not the Y generation. The, you know, the buyer for, for this Lexus ES is going to be older. It's a big, comfortable car with a lot of interior volume and, uh, you know, pretty quiet. We think it'll bring in a little bit younger people. We're not aiming this as a Gen Y. That's not a Gen Y car. But we make it open to or attractive to a little younger buyer while making it also very um, in demand from a current generation of owners. At the Detroit Auto Show, Lexus unveiled the LFLC concept, which offers a glimpse into the future of Lexus design. The front grille, for example, can already be found on the new ES. The front new spindle grille is really kind of giving them this sort of branded image now that is obviously so popular in the industry right now. And I think that'll work to their advantage because it is kind of mean looking. So, I mean, that might, uh, that might scare a little bit of the older demographic and it might bring in a little bit of the younger ones. The ES300H is the first ever hybrid ES. It runs on a 2.5 liter four-cylinder Atkinson cycle engine. One of the things I really like about the hybrid is, is the way the new powertrain seems to be integrated. It's, it's probably the most satisfying hybrid drivetrain I've experienced to date. I'm the last person to, to recommend a hybrid, but I actually enjoy driving it. The 350 is a 3.5 liter V6, um, a great engine, uh, fuel efficient, provides that little extra power for people who are looking for the conventional vehicle. Electric power steering on, on both models, the 350 and the 300H, uh, and it's actually adaptable so when you would switch to sport mode, the, you'll get a little more of a direct feel with electric power steering. That's one of the benefits of electric power steering is you can modify it based on the driving behavior that you want. Uh, you can modify how much assist it really gives you. Whether we like it or not, key fobs are here to stay. But with the new ES, there's something interesting with this key fob. As you approach the car, let's say at night in a parking lot, when you reach a certain distance, all the lights come on and the doors unlock. Pretty cool. Now, once you get to the trunk, yes, there is a latch. However, you need the key fob, not in the car, right here. I know, redundant. But once you open the trunk, 15.2 cubic feet of space. It does have room for skis. However, the seats do not fold down. And that seems to be a trend with luxury cars. Question is why? There's a trade-off. Either you split it for you know flexibility to, for storage. Um, when they're not foldable, you end up with a more rigid vehicle. So it helps for handling and performance and smoothness and overall comfort of the vehicles. I actually like this car. I'm I'm surprised they seem to have spent some money on suspension damping through some rough roads. The, the car's not bottoming out. It's really composed, and I was really surprised. Personally, I think most people should spend more time on their driving and less time on trying to be connected. However, on this new ES, there is some technology. It's not new, but I like it. The seats, both seats are heated. Both seats have 10-way adjustable settings. Unfortunately, unlike its predecessor on the base model, the seats are not leather and the steering wheel is not heated. It also has tire pressure monitors, lane departure monitors, and the one I like is the automatic high beam. You set it, then at night, when it detects a car coming towards you, the high beam shuts off, and then when the car clears, it automatically turns on. One less thing to worry about at night. I think they've kind of hit two demographics here instead of the previous one, which was kind of that geriatric car. I think now they're leaning a little bit more toward, uh, I might be nearing geriatric, but I don't necessarily want to admit it yet. 
Well, dare I say, I think it's a little more masculine. So, I mean, not to say that this was in any way a chick car in the past, but uh, I just think with that AMG styling and the, the skirts a lot more aggressive around the front, that it definitely has a, a lot meaner, more aggressive look to it for sure. The electric car of the future, it's probably pretty much like the electric car of the present. More later on Kenzie's Corner. It's been the tuner's darling for donkey's years. On this edition of Test Drive, the Honda Civic Si. When it comes to the Civic tuner market, name it and there's a highly modified part. It runs to the point where there's a modification for just about every meaningful component, along with myriad performance add-ons. Not to be left out of this highly lucrative market, Honda has added the Honda Factory Performance, or HFP package, to the Civic Coupe. The starting point is the Civic Si. The HFP package then adds deeper front and rear air dams, bolder side sills, and a deck lid spoiler. It also brings attractive 18-inch wheels wearing P215 40 tires. While the cabin of this HFP is pretty much stock Civic, meaning two-tier dash, two very comfortable seats, you do get a couple of noteworthy items. The first, a full-on navigation system, and the second, a 360-watt audio system that really does crank out the tunes. The one piece I did like sits up here in the information display. It actually shows you the engine output. Now, for the most part, you never really see much more than about 75% until the IV tech system kicks in. When that happens and you've got 100% output coming from that engine, this thing picks up its side sills and runs like the wind. Beneath the sheet metal, the HFP suspension has been heavily massaged. The new springs, which drop the ride height by a rather shallow 10 millimeters, complement the new high-performance dampers. These mods and the better tires bring a car that really hunkers down and eats fast on-ramps. The unspoken benefit is it accomplishes this without trashing the ride quality. The other bonus is found in the helical limited slip differential. Keeping both front wheels engaged in the business of providing traction cuts unwanted wheel spin and helps to control torque steer. I have long been a fan of the Civic Si, and primarily because of its fun to drive quotient. This HFP, well, it runs rings around it, and it boils down to all of those suspension changes. Where the Si is good, this one is exceptionally good. With the vast majority of the weight sitting right over the front wheels, I expected to run into terminal understeer. Yes, you do find some, but nowhere near as much as I expected. This thing is surprisingly balanced and remarkably neutral. The HFP arrives with the same 2.4-litre four-cylinder engine that powers the SI. This means 201 horsepower and 170 pound-feet of torque. Now, this engine pulls strongly at first, then gives the driver a swift kick in the pants at about 5,000 RPM when the iVTEC system begins to do its thing. When this happens, the engine seems to take a deep breath and sprint towards redline. In the end, it accomplishes the run from rest to 100k in 6.6 .6 seconds and the more important 80 to 120 passing move in 4.4 seconds. Whilst accessing the back seat is pretty easy and you'll find decent rear seat legroom, there is a problem. When you sit back in the seat, you and this piece of glass become great friends. Every time you go over a bump, bang! As my cameraman says, it is a noggin knocker of the first order. The power is put down through a six-speed manual gearbox in the front wheels. Now the transmission is, pun intended, the model of civility. The short show's defined gait and progressive clutch means it's a cinch to run through the gears at the required speed. While the exterior differences to this HFP are subtle in nature, the improvements in the handling are anything but. The Civic Si is good in its own right. This version is excellent and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. If there is one thing I'd like, another 20 horsepower, please.
It's been a long time coming. We had quite a long life cycle on the outgoing SL, so this has been a, a very exciting launch for us. And the new SL is, is better in, in, in every way. It's, uh, it's faster, handles better, better fuel economy, so all around we've made improvements to the car. I'm impressed with the new, uh, the new engine, the new 4.6 liter bi turbo V8. 429 horsepower, zero to 60 in 4.6 seconds, and that's that's the same as what the old SL63 used to do. So we're talking, you know, AMG level performance in our base vehicle now, and on top of that, it gets 18% better fuel economy as well. The body structure for the SL, it's uh, the first time we've done an all aluminum body structure. It's made the vehicle lighter. The SL is actually 130 kilograms lighter than the old version, along with the new engine, etc. It uh, just adds to the performance equation. People kind of smile when you talk about value in a car that's over $100,000, but our customers at any price point are looking for a, a good combination of, of features for the money, and at that price point, we offer it. There I say I think it's a little more masculine, so I mean not to say that this was in any way a chick car in the past, but uh, I just think with that AMG sky styling and the, the skirts a lot more aggressive around the front, that it definitely has a, a lot meaner, more aggressive look to it for sure. We like to provide that balance of, of comfort, luxury, but also performance, because we know that's what our customers are looking for. They want a car that can do it all, and, and the SL really can. Uh, with the suspension setup, with the active body control, you can, you can choose what kind of experience you want to have. So it's, it's your choice what you want to experience. And of course, uh, we have Mercedes-Benz uh, luxury, comfort, and safety uh, standard on every vehicle as well. So it really strikes that balance that uh, it gives you whatever you want on any given day. It's been a fantastic car for years, and like I said, this one's just a little bit better all the way around. I mean, there's nothing you can't do with this car. You can go like a madman, or you can cruise around the city in it, and it looks great. I mean, and you know, you got the hard top that goes up or down, so you can drive it in the summer or the winter, but, uh, and the air scarf in the back is fantastic, because even on cold days, I mean, you can't drive with the roof down. It's just, it's great. Well, I think that one of the biggest features that stands out is the, the lack of air in the cabin with the top down. I mean, as soon as you drop the top on this car, roll the windows up, put the uh, back skirt up on it, you've got that air scarf blowing hot air on the back of your neck. Really, you, you, unless you look up and realize that the sky's above you, you don't really know that the top is down in that car. some things that you would maybe not look at in a traditional sports car, something like the wiper blades. The jets are integrated right in the wiper arm. It only uh, sprays fluid in the direction of the wipers moving. And what that does is it reduces the amount of uh, fluid you need to clean your windows. So in a road, so that's important. You're not gonna get spray back into the passenger compartment. The system is heated from uh, right from the reservoir right up to the wiper arms. And uh, in the winter, you won't have to worry about ice and snow buildup with this system as well. When you get into these six-figure vehicles, you have to look at the entire package, and this car really does deliver that entire package. It's that combination of luxury, of sports, of performance, and it's also got the street cred to back it up. I mean, it's just a beautiful looking car from every single angle, and I mean, if that's the statement that you want to make, it's definitely going to make that statement for you. Well, it looks like it's a cloudy future for show and shines. I'm Ted Laternas, and I'll tell you why on MotoringTV.com. that customer uh, doing a little bit more of highway versus city driving will probably be more interested in the Sonic because it's a little bit larger. But if you're living, you know, right downtown, you need a car to zip around traffic and you want, uh, you know, a car that's easy to park with and also better city fuel economy, then the obvious choice will be the Spark. That is a Mini Cooper S Roadster. And this is its two minute test drive with a twist. The Mini Roadster is the latest Mini to enter the Mini lineup. Its seats too has a removable soft top that stores in a rear compartment. Its 1.6 liter twin scroll turbocharged engine puts out 181 horsepower, 5,500 RPM, and it weighs in at just 1,245 kilograms, which gives it a power to weight ratio of 6.87. It also has this rear spoiler that deploys at 80 kilometers an hour, and it provides a useful 70 pounds of downforce. This one is loaded with premium sport and entertainment packages, along with some standalone options like the 17-inch wheels. This is the Jonak Motorsport F4i. It's a fuel-injected four-stroke 125cc shifter cart. It produces 15 horsepower at a staggering 10,500 RPM, and it weighs in at just 74 kilograms, for a power to weight ratio of 4.9, compared to the Mini, which is at 6.87.
The problem is, to test the cart, you need one of these. And with a driver like Justin Wilson, that changes the power to weight ratio to 9.97. So now the advantage goes to the Mini Cooper S Roadster. So let's find out, does the Mini really handle like a shifter cart? Count on the handling of the Mini to be able to keep up to these tight twisty sections, and I'm counting on the better power to weight ratio to actually catch it down the straightaway. And if that doesn't work, I'm just gonna run him over. I can see he's still right with me. Every now and again, I can see him just in my mirror, so as long as I can hold him up through here. And so far, he hasn't come by, so that's good news. So does the Mini Cooper S actually handle like a shifter cart? From where I was sitting, it was pretty darn close. The Mini Cooper S Roadster gets a combined fuel mileage rating of 6.7 liters per 100. That's pretty impressive. But you'll have to trust me on this. If you drive it like it's meant to be driven, you're not gonna be close. I'm Russ Bond for the two minute test run. The motoring tip of the week is brought to you by Walmart. For everyday low prices on Pennzoil, conventional and synthetic oils. Our motoring tip of the week concerns batteries. When you're replacing the battery in your vehicle, there's a number of choices to be made. And choice is a great thing, but you need to understand why and what you're picking. Now, when you go to the batteries, you may have a number of different selections. First of all, we're gonna look at the BCI group size. That's what describes the physical fitment of the battery, the battery that physically fits this vehicle. Now, this, this Ford Edge takes a BCI group 59 battery. That describes the terminal layout and dimensions. It needs 540 cold cranking amps, and when we pick the battery, it's gotta have at least 540 cold cranking amps or higher. Now, when we go to the battery shelf to make the battery selection, a number of choices again. You may have a good, better, best scenario, and how much you pay depends on how much performance you get. We've got the basic battery, one year free replacement warranty. This one's a top post and a side post, what we call a dual terminal, so it'll fit multiple cars. Move up to this battery, we get three years free replacement warranty, higher cold cranking amps, and more minutes of reserve capacity, and the ultimate top of the line battery, the absorbed glass mat battery, which is the most durable battery and the highest performance as well. Now when you opt up to a better battery, you typically get three things. More warranty, as I just mentioned, higher cold cranking amps, which gets you started on the cold morning, and more reserve capacity. And reserve capacity is a rating of a 25 amp load and how many minutes the battery can sustain that. And how that relates to you is if your alternator should fail and you have to limp the car home with no charging system, it's the number of minutes you can drive before the battery fails or won't start the car. It's also relating to you leaving the door open or the headlights on, parking lights, listening to the radio on accessory. How long can you do that and still have the car start reliably? So when you have those choices, opting up to a slightly more expensive premium battery is money well spent. That's your motoring tip of the week. People need to drive these cars and, and see what they can do and compare them against the perceived younger cars because this is not your grandpa's Cadillac. I've primarily driven German cars in the past, but I need the practicality of the wagon and fit and finish. Uh, just They've done a great job on the car and then value for it, um, you know, compared to some of the German automakers, it's exceptionally good. You would never have thought that you would come out here with a, a wagon, but I, I'm having a great day. Closed captioning for Motoring 2013 is brought to you by Greener, Fuel Efficient, Global. This is Chevrolet Now, driving our world forward. I was accused recently, I think by a younger person, that having me talk about electric cars is like having Toronto Mayor Rob Ford review the Gay Pride Parade. Well, I'm not entirely sure of the connection, but I think he was making a shot at the fact that I'm old. Well, the reason I'm old is I'm smart enough not to get killed. Sometimes with gray hair comes a bit of wisdom. Now, I know all you young people love the idea of electric cars. Not that any of you can actually afford to buy a car, let alone an electric. But there may be two things about electric cars you don't know. First of all, the batteries are made of lithium. Typically, you do know that. Do you know that there are two sources of lithium in the world that have enough there to be commercially viable? One is China. 
Do we want to get even more tightly connected to that country's economy than we are now? The second one is in Bolivia. Now, if you liked Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, you're going to love Bolivia's Evo Morales. There's going to be an organization of lithium exporting countries, and there'll only be two of them. We're going to kill to have Saudi Arabia to kick around anymore, because that's what's going to happen. Now, speaking of Saudi Arabia, they have the largest reserves of petroleum. You know where the second largest reserve is? In the South China Sea, just off the coast of Vietnam. Now, Vietnam and China have been at war for 10,000 years, but with all that oil in the ground, you know they're going to find a way to extract it. And what does that mean to you young people out there? Your grandchildren are going to be driving cars 100 years from now. 90% of them are going to be powered by gasoline. That's not old, that's the fact. I'm Jim Kenzie. Since it debuted in 1990, the Lexus ES has accounted for 25% of the company's global sales. And with that in mind, it invited press from around the world to drive this ES here in Oregon, and that included Russia, which accounts for the temporary no smoking signs that we found in the vehicle. As for the ES, yes, it's a step up from the fifth generation. Yes, it should have leather seats in the base. And yes, I really like the electric power steering, although some commented they found it just a bit light. Now remember, the demographic starts at about 63 years old, but there's enough bells and whistles to keep it interesting. And I think that loyal customers will be happy, and who knows, they might even attract a few new ones into the showroom. Before we go, make sure you check us out at motoringtv.com. We want to hear from you. Get in on the conversation by joining us on Facebook for the total motoring experience. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. That tank was uh, absolutely bleeping unreal. I mean, the guy had taken a military tank, lopped the gun off, cut the top deck off, put in scaffolding so that these unsuspecting idiots that paid to go on a ride could hold on to a steel bar as this maniac went romping up and down hills.